Now then, in the next few minutes, the Prime Minister is to address members of the Trades Union Congress who've gathered for their annual conference in Brighton. It is expected that Sir Keir Starmer will warn workers that decisions on pay will be shaped by the tough decisions needed to protect the economy. This amid calls from unions for pay restoration to address the low inflation rises. And you can just see there the uh, Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, has entered. He is uh, sitting down. He's not due to talk until uh, 11 o'clock. And they cut adult education to the bone. Our political correspondent, uh, Ian Watson, is in Brighton for us. Uh, and uh, Ian, just uh, just take us through what we're expecting Sakir to talk to Congress about this morning. Well, there's certainly been no new announcements from Keir Starmer. It will be some of the things that we've heard from him before on difficult choices. As far as I'm aware, he's not actually going to use the words winter and fuel together. That debate, of course, taking place this afternoon in the House of Commons. But he is going to frame that as part of these difficult choices, which will include potentially future pay increases. And I think that aspect of it is aimed not so much at the audience in the room, but the wider audience, because he was under fire, of course, for some of these big pay rises immediately after Labour came to power, while simultaneously taking away money from uh, some of the pensioners who are not on pension credit, 10 million pensioners. So he'll be saying, actually, you know, the unions may face a rough road ahead, but he'll also be saying things which you expect them to cheer as well. He'll be hailing the biggest uplift, as he'll call it, in workers' rights in a generation. There's going to be the, re uh, the repealing of two major pieces of conservative anti-trade union legislation, as he would see it. And there's also going to be the promise of more uh, workers' rights, rights to organise, more rights in the workplace. So that, I think, will go down relatively well. But I can tell you from conversations as well as what's been said publicly by some union leaders. At the very least, they don't think that uh, the party leadership has handled uh, the winter fuel row desperately well. And they will be worried about some other issues as well, some of which were discussed yesterday here at the TUC. For example, they're worried about what will happen to oil and gas workers as Labour moves towards its green transition. They're worried too about whether there's too tight a grip being held on public spending. Uh, but I think we're going to hear from Keir Starmer himself. No point in me telling you what he's going to say. Let's hear it from the Prime Minister. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Congress. It's such a pleasure to be back with you again here in Brighton, a city of sanctuary, of solidarity, and a city that once again this summer showed that there's no place for hatred, division, or violence on our streets. A city that I'm delighted to say now has a Labour Council once again. And a city that's joined by a string of Labour MPs across Sussex from Worthing to Hastings. And Congress, Brighton holds a special place in my heart. Because three years ago, I gave my first in-person conference speech as Labour leader here in this very hall. I said that our party had to change if we were to win a general election. And Congress, we did. And thank you all for the part that you played in that. <clears throat> and now, because of the hard work that we did together, I'm able to address this Congress for the first time as Prime Minister. The first time, I think I'm right in saying, that a Prime Minister has come here for 15 years, since 2009. 2009, and Paul, that's a year you will remember well. It's the last time Everton got through to a cup final. Although, I actually think you lost 2-0 to one of the lesser London teams. Uh, so, the one promise I can make today is that Prime Ministerial visits were a bit more frequent, perhaps, than Everton Cup finals. Because, in all seriousness, I sat on the opposition benches and took many a lecture from the Tories, telling the world what working people do or don't want, 
and you know that every single one of them was delivered without the common decency of coming here and showing some respect to the people who fight for the living standards of working people every single day. And that era is now over, Congress. <laughs> and I would like to thank every one of you who played a role in ending it. Every one of you who took to the streets and the doorsteps of your communities to remove the burden of Tory rule from our shoulders. But even more importantly, I'd like to thank every one of you who held the social fabric of this country together through 14 years where it came under relentless attack. The cleaners, the carers, the nurses, physios, shop workers, drivers, builders, cooks, posties, farmers, retailers, warehouse workers, technicians, teachers and teaching assistants, I could go on, the working people who got us through the pandemic and so much more, the backbone of this country. Because Congress, the chance we now have, the opportunity to rebuild Britain, that hope is here because of those efforts. So thank you all for everything you do and have done for our country. But now, the job of rebuilding begins. And I have to level with you. As I did on the streets in Downing Street just over two months ago, this will take a while. It will be hard. But just as we had to do the hard graft of change in our party, now we have to roll up our sleeves and change our country. And Congress, the light of a fairer Britain, a more prosperous, secure and dynamic country, is at the end of the tunnel. That doesn't mean that it's easy to get there. The Tories knew it would be like this. That's why they called the election early. And we saw, as I'm sure you all did, just how ruthlessly they were prepared to salt the earth of Britain's future, serving themselves to the bitter end. And that's why we were so clear and specific about the first steps in our election campaign. We didn't want to go further because we knew there would be new problems, unknown problems, when we finally saw the books. And with trust in politics so low, I had to be honest with the British public when I was standing in the full sunlight of democracy. I owed it to them to promise only what we knew we could deliver. And yet, Congress, even in our worst fears, we didn't think it would be this bad. The pollution in our rivers, the overcrowding in our prisons, so much of our crumbling public realm, universities, councils, the care system, all even worse than we expected. Millions of pounds wasted disgracefully on a Rwanda scheme that they knew would never work. Politics reduced to an expensive, divisive, noisy performance. A game to be played, not the force that can fundamentally change the lives of those that we represent. And Congress, the bill for that performance is now in. And I'm afraid if we don't take action, it's a check that will bounce. Britain left with a social black hole and a financial one. £22 billion this year alone. Concealed, not just from us, not just from you and working people, but even from the Office of Budget Responsibility, the watchdog that is there precisely to protect working people. Now, no one in this room wants to hear such a gloomy forecast. I get that. I don't want to be saying it either. It's not how any government would want to begin its work. Yet, given what happened with Liz Truss, given that, unlike 14 years ago, borrowing costs are high, and the risk of inflation is real. 
I owe working people the respect of economic stability, a responsibility not to be reckless with their money. That is the mandate we have won. And we will deliver this by fixing the foundations of our country, taking those first steps towards the long-term change that we need. That is how this government will return wealth creation to Britain, to the service of working people. Because Congress, make no mistake, that is the opportunity here. This is not a project that will be content to achieve a good few Labour things and leave the broader economic settlement untouched. No, the crisis we've inherited means we must go deep into the marrow of our institutions, rewrite the rules of our economy, fix the foundations so we can build a new home. A country where growth not only comes from the enterprise of working people, but where growth serves the interests of working people. Living standards rising, not just because we're redistributing from prosperous parts of the country, but because we're growing the economy in every community. That is our mission. Who is growth for? Who does it serve? The right answer, the Labour answer, the British answer must be working people, and that is the change that we stand for. <laughs> and there's nothing new in this. It's the purpose of the Labour Party now and always. And throughout this government, no matter the storm, the service of working people will be our anchor, our still point in a turning world, the people we hold in our mind's eye as we face up to the daunting challenge of our inheritance and secure our mission on growth. That's why we've already reformed the remit of the Low Pay Commission to take account of the cost of living and deliver a real living wage. It's why we've launched a new National Wealth Fund to invest in the critical infrastructure our industries need and drive growth into every community. It's why we've unlocked solar and onshore wind, started bringing rail back into public ownership, committed to a proper industrial strategy, switched on great British energy, and begun, in partnership with you and business, the biggest levelling up of workers' rights in a generation. And let's be really clear about why we need this New Deal. It's because this government is committed to driving up living standards, improving productivity, and working in partnership with workers. And Congress, as part of that New Deal, let me again be crystal clear. We will repeal the 2016 Trade Union Act, get rid of minimum <laughs> service level legislation, and the cheap and vindictive attacks on this movement and turn the page on politics as noisy point once and for all. And Congress, this is the opportunity of power. It was hard won and hard fought for. I want to thank the General Secretary for his role in that. Paul has always been a campaigner the force of nature. And across the movement, there are people without whom we could not have done this. Too many to thank here, but they know who they are. Because election victories don't fall from the sky, certainly not for the Labour Party. But as well as your support, we also had to change. This election would not have been won if we had not changed. We have the chance now to repair our public services because we changed the Labour Party. We have the chance to make work pay because we changed the Labour Party. We have the chance to deliver for working people, young people, vulnerable people, the poorest in our society because we changed the Labour Party. 
So when I say country first, party second, that isn't a slogan. It's the guiding principle of everything this government will do. We ran as a changed Labour Party and we will govern as a changed Labour Party. And so I make no apologies for any of the decisions we've had to take to begin the work of change. And no apologies to those still stuck in the 1980s who believe that unions and business can only stand at odds, leaving working people stuck in the middle, who cannot see that this country needs a new path on growth. People who describe policies that give working people more security, more protection, more power and dignity at work, or even the fundamentals of industrial strategy, which is common across the world, as anti-growth. Let me tell you what is anti-growth. An economy where real wages stagnated for 15 years. That's anti-growth. An economy where productivity keeps on flatlining. That's anti-growth. An economy where the state of our public services prevents people going to work because they're ill. That's anti-growth. And so, I won't take lectures from the Tories or others who complain every time this government tries to undo the damage that they have done, clinging desperately to the failed model of the past. And nor will I take seriously the complaints of people who had their time, faced with the same difficult problems, chose to run away from the responsibility of fixing them. A party that allowed the politics of easy answers and distraction to become their comfort zone rather than face the responsibility and reality of government. That has changed. Let me tell you, I see the nurses, the teaching assistants, the carers who can't afford to get their boiler fixed or buy their kids a new school uniform. I see them. I see the public sector demoralised, burnt out in some places, gripped by a recruitment and retention crisis that holds back your ability to do what we all believe in, the service of working people. I see all that. And so I can guarantee this is not and never will be a government that will sit around the table with you and tell you that black is white. But I do have to make clear from a place of respect that this government will not risk its mandate for economic stability under any circumstances. And with tough decisions on the horizon, pay will inevitably be shaped by that. I owe you that candor. And I'll tell you why. It's because, as was so painfully exposed by the last government, when you lose control of the economy, it's working people who pay the price. I'll never let that happen under a Labour government. And that's why I call now, as before the election, for the politics of partnership with us in government, with business, and most importantly of all, with working people. Now that sounds very straightforward and attractive, but I'll tell you this, it's much more difficult. Alongside collaboration, it also requires compromise. It demands that we work through our disagreements and with those who have a different perspective. Partnership is a more difficult way of doing politics. I don't deny that. I know there's a clarity in the old ways, the zero-sum ways. Business versus worker, management versus union, public versus private, pick your side to the victor, the spoils. Nonetheless, I say to everyone now, and I think many of you already know this, that kind of politics is not what the British people want. When I say to them that our policies will be pro-business and pro-worker, they don't look at me as if I'm deluded. No, they see that as the most ordinary, sensible thing in the world. I know there will always be disputes. Of course there will. But in all seriousness, there is a mood of change in the business world 
a growing understanding of the importance of good work and the shared self-interest that comes from treating the workforce with respect and dignity, the productivity gain of fairness. And Congress, that is an opportunity to be grasped. Business leaders are not knocking on my door, saying they want to rip up employee rights. They don't tell me the problems they face will be solved by coming for the trade unions. They want fair taxes, high skills, and the long-term ability to invest. And that chimes precisely with what trade unions up and down the country tell me they also want. Working people want good companies to make profits, attract investment, and create good jobs. And Congress, in a way, that is why the Tory argument on trade unions no longer finds the same audience. The British people are not interested in those tired old tropes. This isn't the 1980s. The mood is for partnership, and not just on pay, on everything, to turn around our NHS, give our children the start in life that they deserve, make our public services fit for the future, unlock the potential of our clean energy. We have to treat this as an opportunity to come together. We're in power now. This is our chance, Congress. Common cause of national renewal. And so as we rewrite those rules of our economy, as we drag this country back to the service of working people, this is a chance that must be taken. Because rules written in the ink of partnership will be more durable and long-lasting whoever is in power. So it's time to turn the page. Business and unions, the private and public sector, united by a common cause to rebuild our public services and grow our economy in a new way. Higher growth, higher wages, higher productivity, the shared purpose of partnership, the path through the mess the Tories made, and onwards to national renewal. That is the road we are on, Congress, and we won't turn away from it. We will keep to the course of change, reject the snake oil of the easy answer, fix the foundations of our economy, and build a new Britain, more secure, more prosperous, more dynamic, and fairer. Wealth created in every community, a country renewed and returned, calmly but with confidence, to the service of working people. Thank you, Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congress. Uh, it was great to hear from you as Prime Minister, and you can see from the reaction of Congress that you have the support of the trade union movement in the tasks you've set out. Congress, as I indicated earlier, the Prime Minister has agreed to take questions, and we will be taking questions in batches of three, and I invite Paul Novak to introduce our first questions. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks to the Prime Minister, not only for his address, but agreeing to uh, take questions uh, as well. We are going to take six questions uh, from the conference floor, and I'll take those questions in batches of three. So our first question from this side of the room comes from Julia, a social care worker from the North West and a member of Unison. Julia. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you, Congress. Thank you, Prime Minister. Welcome to our town. Thank you. This is the first question of the day. Unison is usually supportive for labor commitment to national care service and pay fair pay agreement for care workers. Social care has suffered terribly for the past 14 years under the Tory. And tackling it, the crisis begins with the workforce. We know very well that far-reaching reform cannot happen overnight. But can the Prime Minister reassess labor long-term commitment to a national care service and getting a fair agreement up 
and running a bit quicker because care worker and support worker, they are suffering up and down the country, including in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. Our second question is from David, who's a United Executive Council member who works in the health sector. David. Thank you, Congress. Thank you, Mr. President. Prime Minister, it's great to be here. I'm pleased to see uh, Labour Prime Minister in this hall. Thank, Thank you. you. As our General Secretary, Sharon Graham, said yesterday, um, I'm sure you heard her great speech. As she said, rates of investment in British industry are the lowest in the G7, and other countries have much more money set aside for future investment. If we don't in start investing much more in industry now, how can we ensure Britain gets the good quality jobs we need workers to transition into, and especially our green jobs and the still works that we all want. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thanks, Thanks uh, David. And our third and final question in, the, in this section is from Sonia, who's a uh, branch secretary for school support staff at the GMB. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Congress, and welcome, Keir. Thank you. Um, Labour's commitment to reinstate the, court, the school support staff negotiating body is incredibly welcome. We'd like to know, does the government agree it's time to recognise the pivotal role played by school support staff and end the scandal of term time only contracts? Uh, thank, you. thank you, colleagues, for those questions. Let me take them in turn. Firstly, Julia, in relation to care and the care service. As I think I've said to this Congress before, um, uh, I know about this. My sister is a care worker. I know just how difficult it is, how fragile the working conditions are, and it's hugely important that we make that commitment, as we have done and as we do, to a national care service. That is one of the absolute objectives of this government to create that national care service. And it does, of course, start with the staff. It doesn't end with the staff, but it starts with the staff. Because you will know um, across um, your unions, across your members, um, just how fractured the working conditions are. And that's the reason, amongst others, that so many leave care to go and work in other sectors because they want a framework that is better for them. So it starts with the staff um, and the fair pay agreement. It will be the first of its kind uh, that we will be bringing through. And we've deliberately chosen the care sector because we think it's the sector that most needs it. So that's the foundational stone, if you like, of the National Care Service. But we made a commitment to this. We'll stick to that commitment. We will see this through. And we look forward to working with you, Christina and others, to deliver on this really important commitment. Uh, David, on investment, you, you, you hit the nail on the head in one of the major failings of the last 14 years, which is we haven't had enough investment in to this country, to our economy, to the businesses in which your members work. And this matters hugely. Um, whenever I ask uh, investors why they haven't put the money into the United Kingdom in recent years, they tell me it's because of the chaos of the last 14 years, particularly the recent years, with chopping and changing Prime Minister's Chancellor's strategies. That is not to create the conditions for investment. The way to create the conditions for investment is economic stability, real clarity and strategy about where we're going as a government, whether it's on clean power 2030 or other strategic decisions, so we can get that investment in, make sure uh, that we get the growth that we need, and growth in every part of the country. And just on growth, because it's so important, yes, we want economic growth, your members want economic growth. We want wages to go up. We want living conditions to improve. We want to have public services to be better. And we need it across the whole of the country. And that's why I said what I said about redistribution. 
I don't want a model that says growth is only for some parts of the country and redistribution is the answer for other parts of the country. We've got to have the commitment, the determination to make sure that investment brings growth across all parts of our country. Uh, and that's why we set up the National Wealth Fund. That's why the industrial strategy is so important um, and great British energy to, to make sure that we get that investment in. So thank you, David, for that question. And then Sonia on school support staff and the negotiating body. It's really important that we've reinstated the negotiating body because I want every single child, wherever they come from, whatever their background, to have the best education they can possibly have. And that is down to our teachers and our support staff who do an incredible job in difficult circumstances. And we owe them not just a negotiating body, but our respect. Um, and it is that, in that spirit that we will work with them um, to deliver uh, the first-class education that every child uh, absolutely is entitled to in this country. So thank you, Sonia, for raising that really important issue. Thanks, Paul. Th thanks, Prime Minister. Our fourth question, and we're going over to the other side of the hall, is from Helen, who works in defence and is president of Prospect's defence sector. Helen? Thank you. Um, Prospect's recent survey of women in civilian roles in the Ministry of Defence found that, shockingly, over 60% have experienced or witnessed sexual harassment at work. What will the government do to make the defence industry and workplaces safe for women? Uh, thanks, Helen. Uh, the next question is from Alan, who's the National President of the Educational Institute of Scotland and a Principal Teacher of English. Alan? Good morning, Prime Minister. The UK is one of the richest countries in the world, but poverty is wrecking the lives of more than a quarter of our children. The two-child benefit cap, punitively introduced by the last government, is a driver of poverty among larger families and is negatively impacting the lives of 1.6 million children. Controversially, your government has not scrapped the two-child benefit cap. What alternative urgent measures are you therefore taking to immediately alleviate the poverty experienced by 4.3 million children across the UK? Oh, OK. Thanks, Alan. And our, our sixth and final question is from Jane, who's a retail worker from North Wales and who's also president of Usdor. Thanks Jane. for that, Paul. Morning, Prime Minister. Um, I work in retail, and increasing levels of violence, threats and abuse are a massive concern for me and for my colleagues. Labour's welcome commitment to introduce a specific offence of assaulting a retail worker will send out a clear message that this government takes retail crime seriously. What more will your government do to help us feel safe at work? Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, Helen, let me start with the question of sexual harassment, because uh, that figure of 60% is shocking, I think, um, for any of us to hear. Um, and it's not just in defence. It will be across all other sectors in the public and private, sexual harassment at work is never, ever acceptable, and we have to take measures to grapple with it. And that's why I'm really pleased that in the New Deal legislation, there will be stronger protection in relation to sexual harassment. That's much needed and can't come quick enough, so far as I'm concerned. I think we have to have a wider uh, mission here as well, because whether it's the workplace or elsewhere, sexual harassment, violence against women and girls, is unacceptable in all its forms and all its places. Um, and that's why, within the missions that we've set out for government, I've made violence against women and girls central uh, to that, because I'm determined that we, together with you and others, will fight this. It's been talked about for far too long. It's time now for action. I'm really pleased that now we're in power, we can actually act uh, rather than talk about this. So thank you very much for raising that. 
Uh, Alan, thank you for raising um, the question of child poverty. It is a really important issue, as you know, as the whole of Congress knows, and it matters to this government. Obviously, we've had to take difficult decisions, given the economic circumstances we're in, for reasons that I have explained. But that does not diminish, to answer your question directly, our absolute determination in relation to child poverty. It's far too high. It is our responsibility to bring it down. We've already, obviously, set up a task force, but that has to get to the underlying causes as well. This isn't an issue that can be solved just by one adjustment in welfare, frankly. It's about housing, it's about education, it's about wages, it's about conditions in which people live, health, mental health. All of that has to be addressed, and we are determined to address it, and are already addressing it, because just as the last Labour government brought child poverty right down, so will this government. We'll work with you and others and everybody in the room to make sure that we make good on that commitment because it is so important to us um, and we'll work with you on it. So thank you, Alan, for raising it. And Jane, on the question of uh, offences against retail workers, I mean, this truly is shocking. And I know you've raised it a number of times. Osdor's obviously had a very important campaign on it. Paddy Lillis raises it with me pretty well every time we meet, and rightly so. <laughs> and it, I mean, where I, I went to Warrington to the Iceland store there to talk to the staff, and it was the first thing that they spoke to me about. I went to Swindon uh, to the Morrison's shop there, and we had um, an extended session, and the number one issue for them was the abuse that they were uh, coming under. Uh, sometimes in relation to shoplifting, which is prevalent, as you know, but also more generally. Um, and, and then in Southampton, which were smaller shops, but still it was the same issue over and over again. It's not acceptable. It can't be acceptable in any circumstances. It is demoralising for the workforce um, in every single way. And that's why I'm really pleased that we can introduce an offence to deal with it. But we have to go further than that. We can't have a situation where shoplifters can walk in, um, shoplift and walk back out again, and nobody can do anything about it. We're going to turn that, change that, work with you. This has to be a specific uplifted offence. We have to take it seriously. Um, and I'm not wanting to hear again from those that are on the front line about the appalling attacks and insults that they are subjected to. It's everywhere across the country. It is really hard for the workforce to take. You have rightly championed it uh, as a cause. We join you in that cause and we'll do something about it, working with you and other trade unions. Such an important issue. Thank you so much, Congress, for having me. Very good to be with you. Enjoy the rest of Congress. Thank you. On behalf of Congress, I'd like to thank you for... So that's a